Hey, what's up, dudes and dudettes? Drew here from The Anxious Truth. Join again, once again, it's been a while, my friend Monique Coven, all the way from the Great White North. You're not that far north, though. You're no, not, like, not that far. We're yeah. neighbors, kind of. <laughs> sort of. As close as you could be with being in a different country. Anyway, yeah. um, as those of you who have seen Monique's smiling face on my podcast before know her. Otherwise, uh, we'll go over some of a little bit about you, I think, at the end. But um, okay. ba basically, Monique, um, we'll tell everybody where to find you. Monique is a a CPTSD coach certified and all that stuff. And we have done a bunch of these together and they're always good and everybody loves them and I enjoy doing them. So here we are. Great. I'm glad to be here. Yes. On a Saturday morning. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> We're going to talk about, um, I think generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD and whatever other yes. diagnosis and labels that we want to talk about and how they are sort of given this name of disorder at yeah. the end. Yeah. And how that word disorder really changes changes a lot for people automatically with that word disorder. Yeah. We start to feel different about what's happening for us. Yeah, I think you're right. Like we, we talked a little bit about this when we came up with the topic and I think you came up with the topic full credit. No, we me. both did the same day, which was so funny. We both posted something about how normal the experience is and it there's nothing actually wrong or disorder about it. And I wrote something about PTSD and CPTSD and you wrote about anxiety. I'm yeah. like, okay, we got to talk about this. Yeah. And it was a similar thing, which is that so much of what happens in both of those situations the responses, the the expression of it, oh, nice. Um, the expression of it is is normal. Like that's what a human being does. Yet yeah. somehow, when we put that label on it, disorder, illness, mm -hmm. disease, I've heard it called all mm -hmm. of those things. Like mm -hmm. some people think, like, oh, the way I feel is abnormal. I'm not supposed to feel this way. Yeah. yeah. But I don't. You know that that's not true. Yeah. 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 And I think that um, I think I posted something about um, yeah. PTSD or CPTSD is actually a normal reaction to an abnormal experience that you may have. And it's not a disorder, it's a reaction. And when you stick that, that label disorder, and let's say it's a mental health professional or a doctor, whatever, I'm going to only talk about my experience. But what I remember hearing was, I heard, well, let's talk about when I was first given the label of generalized anxiety disorder. Right. I didn't hear generalized anxiety. I heard generalized anxiety disorder. Yeah. And I was like, I have a disorder. And then, you know, all kinds of thoughts and fears rise up from the word disorder, like something is wrong. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think I often have people who get really freaked out by diagnosis and a label. Um, mm -hmm. So that plays into that too. But in, yeah. in the end, it would have been so much better. What you actually wrote was post-traumatic stress disorder is not a disorder. It's a normal reaction, which was so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. people get led into believing that the way they are feeling, whether they're feeling afraid, like, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of anxiety or, you know, panic disorder, that sort of stuff, or, or PTSD, and they're feeling fear, and they're having all those bodily sensations, yeah. like that, that's the problem. The problem is what they're feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's never what they're feeling. That's the problem. Yeah, and and also um, that something has actually gone haywire with their body, and their body is broken, flawed, not working. Help! That's so scary. Right. Um, something uh, when actually, you know, as you know, with anxiety, as I know with anxiety, and as I know with PTSD, our body is responding actually normally. So with PTSD, these are adaptions that we have had to do in order for our body to keep us alive and to keep us safe. It's a natural response. Our body was protecting us and it went into these mechanisms and that is actually normal. There's nothing disorderly about that. So. Right, right. And so and in the end, anxiety. yeah. And you know, like you've heard me say it about a zillion times that it's never how you feel. It's how you react to how you feel, you know, at, at least in what I'm talking about. And I, I, getting people to put their brain around that, that they're yeah. not ill or broken they just developed some bad habits yeah yeah and the the anxiety um i know for myself the feeling of the anxiety or the ptsd symptoms the symptoms are so overwhelming and scary that we get stuck in that but we don't realize that you know those 
the expression of it is just our body responding to fear. If we're having a lot of anxious thinking or we're thinking we're in danger, our body's just responding to that normally. Yes, that's true. Yeah. It has yeah. nothing to do with, you know, some sort of disorder. Or I keep using the term disorder, but nothing is broken inside yeah. Yeah. that's making you feel this way. Yeah. Um, so that's why I really like it. You share that a lot on your, in your, yeah. you know, everywhere. And I love that. Could you imagine had we gone to a doctor and we're all already stressed because we're feeling all this thing, these things, we don't know what's wrong. We feel, and I know I was met with, uh, instead of like, you know, telling me, Oh, it's all right. It's a normal experience. Your body is just real. How different that would have been for me. It would have given me a sense of empowerment. It would have normalized my experience. I think it really would have been helpful. And I'm really hoping that we're going to kind of start to see that, I hope, in the future with, with the mental health profession and all yeah. of that. Well, maybe it is heading that way. I mean, you know, I think, so. I, I think my, you might be a little bit more involved in it than I am, but it, it would be nice. It, you know, I, and I hate to like go, I'm not going to go on a rant on this, but I think a lot <laughs> of times, at least the people who are following me, they wind up in the realm of medical doctors and their general yeah. practitioner. And, you know, there's very little sensitivity yeah. or understanding of the cognitive part of what's going on with the patient. Yes. And, you know, they whip out a prescription pad, not that this is a rant about medications, and, no. but they treat it like it's like yeah. it's the flu or, or they've gotten some <laughs> bodily disease. Really? Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Uh, same here. And I remember my first experience, um, very cold. Um, and it was like, okay, what are your symptoms? All right. It wasn't like the whole person. It wasn't right. like, you know. It was, it was, what's going on? Like, what are your symptoms? What's wrong with you? And so you're like, okay, well, I'm feeling this. And they wanted me to describe the symptoms exactly. And then you feel like you're your symptoms. You're no longer a person. I'm a symptom, you know? And it just, it, it was, um, it was not a good experience for me. I left, instead of feeling calmer and with more understanding, again, with more, a little sense of empowerment, I right. left feeling like, oh my gosh, what the heck is wrong with me? Right. I have a disease. This is terrible. Yeah. Um, back in the day, you know, from, in my story, I was told, well, if you were diabetic, you would take your medicine, you know, you would take your insulin you have a, yeah. you have a chemical ba imbalance, all that stuff. But that, what you just said, I am my symptoms or I am mm -hmm. my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So many people are trapped in that. Like this, yeah. no, 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 this is just me. I have a problem. I have a disorder. I have a problem here. Like, well, you know, let's talk a little bit about, I think how this relates to the, the PTSD thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, in terms of why somebody might feel so you had a, you had a terrible experience or sequence of experiences in the past, and it has led you to this point today where you react in given circumstances, or in given context with these terrible feelings and emotions and physical sensations. But, you know, let's talk about why that's a normal way to feel given your experience. I'm sure you've had to explain this to your, your clients. Of course. And of yeah. course, to my, it's to myself, right? which first normalized the experience. But I think if we don't get educated, and like I said, because it wasn't that long ago where the professionals that I, were de I was dealing with did not, they weren't trauma informed, so it wasn't helpful. Right. Um, so uh, what was your question again? Like <laughs> <laughs> So good. Uh, I've been there so many times, trust me. <laughs> How would you, I know you've had to explain this to clients and to yourself. Why, oh, yeah. why is it normal for somebody yeah. who has been through that traumatic sequence of events to feel what they're feeling today? What is that? Okay. Yeah. So for when we have an, uh, I'll just say when we have an overwhelming experience such as trauma and mm -hmm. trauma is when we have an experience that's not a regular experience, it's overwhelming to our capacity to cope. That's considered trauma. And for many people, they were either raised this way, so they had a very traumatic childhood where there were, was a lot of chaos. There was, they didn't have um, a safe connection with their primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. So attachment is a very huge issue when it comes to trauma. A lot of people did not have that safe attachment. And what happens when we don't have that is that our brain needs to be, as babies, we need to be regulated by that primary caregiver. So when we're not feeling uh, safe or we're, 
not feeling regulated. It's our primary caregiver that comes and soothes us. When we don't have that, we're already, our brain gets primed for threat, for fear. Mm -hmm. And very, very young, we become looking out for, for threat. And what tends to happen then when we have trauma and trauma, everything is a threat and we're always on guard. So you can kind of see how our, we have already become prone to being afraid. Right. And, um, and so we develop adaptions so that we can feel safe. And the adaptions are sometimes disassociation. So um, many people who have had trauma uh, in childhood they're like, I have so many blank spots. I don't remember so much. That was because our brain did something to keep us safe. Our mm-hmm. bodies did something to keep us safe. They took us away mm-hmm. and we went somewhere else. And that is actually such an amazing ability of our body. It's completely natural. It did what it needed to do to keep us alive. And that's an adaption. Mm-hmm. And so if, we do, if we've done that over and over and over and over again, our body just threat, oh, I'm scared. Goodbye. We go somewhere else then it becomes, our bodies get used to doing that. It becomes a habit, it becomes conditioning. And so I know for myself, here I am, I became an adult, so glad that all that's behind me. I'm gonna have a great life now, calm, peace, joy, bliss. Well, what I found was I couldn't do it. I could not stay in the present moment. And I had no clue why nobody helped me with that. So I thought something was wrong. Uh, I was given the diagnosis of, you know, a disorder, generalized anxiety disorder first. Um, but but what I learned later was that was a natural adaption of my body and my brain to go away. That's why I can't stay present. My body feels very unsafe inside. Mm-hmm. I'm always feeling unsafe. Mm-hmm. And so I explain how normal that is. So that was just one example of adaptions, but we have many. Adaptions are okay, well, we've learned that we better keep our mouth shut and not speak up, otherwise we're in trouble. So we people please, or we, you know, all of these different kinds of adaptions to keep us quote unquote safe. Right. And what ends up happening is we are so far removed from, you know, you've heard people say authentic self, but what authentic self really means is being Mm ourselves, saying what we really want to say instead of keeping our mouth shut or, you know, trying something we really want to try, but not trying it because we're so scared or, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, Just kind of showing people that these are adaptions and that we can learn by first awareness, like, because many of us are living so it's under the radar where we're 95% of our behavior is subconscious. So we're operating and we have no clue why, but we're just doing it. But becoming aware, oh, okay, these are adaptions I'm experiencing and I'm operating in. We become aware and that's where we can kind of have the choice to start to change. And then with this feeling of not being safe, it's about learning how to be safe in our body. Um, So likely, and of course, you know, I'm big on the the cognition, on the thoughts that create our feelings. So it's a lot of that. I think that is such such a good explanation. These last few minutes... I got to believe are incredibly valuable to anybody who's going to listen to that because you explained that incredibly clearly. Thank you very much. And I think the big takeaway from that to go back to our our thing of trying to sort of normalizing this a little bit is it has nothing to do with the fact that you were either born with some disease or broken or illness, or you, you got ill or your brain is broken. You can bring it, even if you want brought to bring it all the way back to infant days. And some people do want to do that and that's fine. It's still an adaption, a learned thing. You know, like there, there's, there are cues in the environment where we read the cues, we behave accordingly and how we read those cues make a difference. So the way you learn to read them at 10 years old or five years old or three years old is the way you read them at 40 years old too, unless you become aware of it and start to change that direction. So that's, I just posted something, um, a couple of, I don't know when I put something pops in my head and I post it. (laughs) I write it. Um, and me and both. It, yeah. <laughs> I'm making it up as I go along. Hey, this is a good thing to say. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was something about that, that, that I thought I was just going to outgrow that stuff and become like a happy, you know, um, embodied adult. Yeah. And we don't outgrow it. We don't outgrow it. Like it, you said. Right. Like the passage of time alone doesn't change anything. Mm-hmm. And that is such a huge thing too. So be empowered at the idea that, whether the issue is that there's some trauma in your past or you've got an anxiety disorder compounded by trauma, it's yeah. still a thing you learned and something that you learn, yeah. you can unlearn 
but yeah. but you do not unlearn things just by waiting for time to pass. That doesn't yeah. happen. There's no automatic yeah. immune response. I say all the time, because um, you know, addressing your thing, I thought it would grow out of it. I, I hope it gets better. Just sitting and mm -hmm. hoping it gets better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it, you know, if you get the flu. We retreat, you lay in bed, you blow your nose for a week, and your body has an immune response and the flu goes away. Right. So it's kind of a passive thing. You just wait and your body will take care of it. This yeah. is never that. You can't just yeah. wait because it yeah. won't change if you just wait. Yeah, because our brains are, um, you know, they're, 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 I don't know, they're conditioned. Mm -hmm. um, we've got that lower brain that, 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 has yeah. learned so many things and goes right into it. Yeah. And when we become aware of that, that, that that's what's going on, it's helpful. But I always come back to, and this has been so, it's been so hopeful and peaceful to me, is that I believe we come into the world with this innate resilience and this well-being that's there. Mm -hmm. That's our, you know, our essence. Right. But then we learn and that, and it gets covered up with yeah. options and beliefs and all kinds of stuff. But as we like, let go of those things and, we start to relearn some of the things that um, we, we not relearn, but we unlearn, I should say right. um, some of the things we get more in touch with, with um, that place, that well being. Mm -hmm. I, I think in the end, so much of it is the innate in ability of every human being to learn and adapt yeah. and change. Yeah. And yeah. Like, you, you see people all the time, mm -hmm. prisoners of war, adapt like people who are incarcerated incarcerated adapt people who live with true chronic you know disabilities physical disabilities and illnesses adapt so we are incredibly adaptable we can learn to do almost anything people with traumatic brain injuries learn to talk again they learn to walk again so the fact that you have always been maybe afraid to go out of the house or fearful in a given context because of your past experience does not doom you to always be that person like yeah. that is changeable and yeah, I, I have a little, little ex um, example. I've shared it on my podcast and maybe even with you, but I just, it's a little concrete example of how we can be one way and then change. So I used to be terrified of this particular highway that I, that I have uh, where I live. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would get sick to my stomach at the thought of it. And it was like, you have to cross like five busy lanes to get there. And I was like, I think about it before and I would be, you know, so sick and nervous and anyway so i would do it and i would be terrified and whatever and then again and then i got a job where i had to cross that highway uh -oh. every uh -oh. single day and it was uncomfortable at the beginning but i tell you by i don't know how long it took whatever it took i uh, was the first one to be zooming across that <laughs> no fear nothing right that's a great example of how we can be one way and so sick and think that things will never change while we're in it. And then two months later, this is just an example. Yeah. Completely yeah. different. I'm the first one crossing over with no fear. How does that happen? Same bridge. We have brand change. Yeah. Same bridge, same highway, same Monique, well, yeah. just a different reaction and, and a yeah. different understanding of the context and the situation. So yeah, yeah that's a thing. And I think, yeah. You know, a lot of people sometimes, and that's why I love to talk to you, because, you know, a lot of people relate to things I'm saying, and often I am, directly to things like panic disorder and agoraphobia, where there are physical sensations, they're afraid, people are afraid to leave the house or do certain things. And they say, yeah, but what about all the emotions and everything that comes along with my trauma? And they want to sort of like, no, I can't fix it because I have trauma. And I hear this on the daily. But in the end, even people that are dealing more mentally with maybe getting into a mental space of, you know, backing away mentally and emotionally for protection, even that, I believe the same principles apply. So somebody who has learned to shut up because they might say something wrong and be judged and be called unworthy or, or, or silly or stupid can learn to start to say things. I can, and we have a mutual friend that is doing that in a spectacular fashion. You know yes, what I'm talking about. Yes, we do. We know we do, who that right? is. And like <laughs> this person is a textbook example of for the last 25 years of my life, I have kept my mouth shut. Let me try saying a little something here. And it's scary and it's, and it's terrifying, but you do it. And then you discover like, oh, okay, this, you know, the same dangers and threats don't exist that existed 25 years ago. It's safe. I can put my toe in the water and then more and more and more and more. And the next thing you know, the person who was yeah. terrified to, to be in the ocean, so to speak, metaphorically, is swimming like a champ. Yeah. Amazing, right? So, uh, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's a, it does. It applies to, it applies to everything. Um, 
I do think with trauma though, I'm, I just been, I did a podcast on this and, and it's been on my mind like crazy. It is important when we have had really horrific um, experiences like childhood trauma that was overwhelming. My feeling is that it's really important if we didn't have a safe connection and the safety of um, our first relationships, I believe healing can begin in that kind of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So when that can repair that sort of not being, tr not feeling, um, not feeling comfortable because you don't trust having a safe relationship where you can share what happened mm -hmm. with someone who is a compassionate witness, something, something changes within us when it's shared. So I think that that's an important thing to talk about, to have that kind of support when yeah. you've had that kind of trauma. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. You know, and, and you know, that that thing that says, well, I have trauma, so I can't do this. Like, well, you're gonna have to work on that too, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes so let's address this for a second. Um, sometimes I think when I'm dealing with people who are say agoraphobic, they are deathly afraid to walk out in the front yard or sitting on the steps or go to the supermarket, whatever it is. But some people who I know are suffering from a traumatic past, they're not deathly afraid necessarily to go to the supermarket, even though they may have developed agoraphobia as an outgrowth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are afraid of experiencing mentally what they experienced in the past. Yes. They are terrified to confront it and, and yeah. feel it again and sit with it. And sometimes, and I could be, you correct me because you are way more, no more than I would do about this, but it seems like part of that healing process is to be able to sit with somebody, whether it's your therapist, your coach, your account, whoever it is, and relive it, but in a place where somebody will say, oh yeah, that was terrible. That should have yes. never happened to you. Like, yes, you have a right to be angry, upset, afraid, all of those things, but they still do have to, you know, kind of confront it. You can't run from it forever. Yeah. Does that make I, sense? I, am, I, I, am I saying yeah, that right? No, no, it, it totally does. But the way that I see it, and again, I can only speak from my own experience, right. was that I, what I went through was really, um, it was, it was horrible. And there was, I was alone and isolated and I, there was no help and nobody. And that was really, that was like an added trauma. And it wasn't until I had someone else who really sat with me and, and um, she, she understood what I was experiencing. And suddenly th that experience was shared and the burden was shared. And, and I don't know, I think that comes back to this human need we have for a connection. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it, it's, it, it's a repairing. Right. So yeah. I think that that's really important. Maybe it helps reframe the experience when you have somebody there to share it with you and, and validate it to a certain extent or acknowledge it, that it was real. You know, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes it, 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 the overwhelm of it can be started to take away a little bit so you can actually reason it a little bit more. When you're alone with no net and no compassionate witness and no support and no validation and no caring at all, Mm -hmm. How are you supposed to actually reason what needs to be reasoned out of the experience? I don't think you can. Mm -hmm. It just becomes purely emotion, purely emotion. So maybe when you have somebody to share that with, you can actually get to that point where you could say, oh, yeah, that was really terrible, but that's not today. That was that was back then. Yeah. And, and I'll have to say, sometimes there is no reasoning like yeah. it, and, but and even having another person say nothing, but just you see in their eyes an expression that I see what happened to you. And it was horrific. Right. Like, I'll give you an example. Now, this is an extreme example. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean in any way to compare the Holocaust to I'm just giving it as an example of uh, trauma. Okay. So I worked as a social worker for many, many years with Holocaust survivors. And I heard firsthand atrocities that they went through. And, um, but there was something in the telling the sharing of the experience that when you share it with another human being, something that is an atrocity. Mm. Again, I don't have words why, I don't get it, but in the experience of the sharing, there comes a sense of I'm not alone, I'm understood, this atrocity is shared, something happens to us. So I really, I'm big on that. I think it is so important to share the uh, experience. I think you can't, you can't argue against that. Yeah. you know, it's, it seems so obvious. I mean, even me, I'm a dynamo mm -hmm. behaviorist. I would say, yeah, you, you got to do that. Like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. what you're saying matters. Like this all works together. It all works together. It's not, you know, while maybe the nuts and bolts of, of exposure and things like that can get you to the supermarket, <clears throat> you, yeah. you have to go through yeah. the other stuff to get to a true yeah. place of full recovery, that sort of thing. 
Yeah. So, yeah. And again, like- it's all normal. Like all of these things are, are normal. It's mm-hmm. just sometimes people are dealing with, you know, abnormal situations. So really it was the situation in the context or the initial reaction or just a slight little brain error that we make that gets blown into an abnormal situation, but never an abnormal person in these, in these cases. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know. I mean, we've been out of 25 minutes. You had, you said so much good stuff here. I can't wait to put this one. Oh. Out. Yeah, yeah. So always so helpful. So. I love chatting with you. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. So I don't want to go too much longer about 25 to 30 minutes is as far as we usually want to go. Um, what else do you want to add? Anything in particular that we can think of on this? I, I always, always want to add because I, I felt like I wasn't given that. So I always try to provide hope. And I think we just did that when we said we normalized it Mm -hmm. and we gave hope that we may have been this way for X number of years, decades, but we can change. Neuroscience proves that we Mm -hmm. can change. So there's hope in this. There's hope that we can have a different experience of life. So I always like to leave with that. Yeah, I think so too. I'm going to leave with this. The fact that I appreciate that you and I do this because- Uh because honestly you uh, we do come at it from different ways and we may yes. have different ways to frame it but in the end i love that we always can find a way and i and i put that squarely on you you, you we always find a way to bring it together somehow and put it out there as a, as almost a unified message or at least complimentary and i really appreciate you for that i do oh i appreciate you yeah, thank you yeah so all right so how do people how yeah if somebody wants to find you, how are they going to find you? I know how to find you, but I don't matter. <laughs> yeah, so I do offer virtual coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can find me, I have a podcast called, we changed the name, mm-hmm. um, the, healing, the Healing Trauma and CPTSD Podcast. Yeah. So that's the podcast. And if you want to find me on my website, it is um, cptsdcoach.com. Yep. Thank you, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. He knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> And, um, and I have a Facebook and I have an Instagram account. It's all linked from your website, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's all there. And I love to share a lot on there. Like Drew, like something comes up in my head. Boom. I'm on there. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. And it's always good. I, I urge everybody, Aww. whether there's trauma or not, like Monique is a, a bit of a shiny light in a day, I think. Cause oh, thank you. You know, the message is always really good. So there you go. Thanks. All right. We're going to do, we'll do more of these for sure. Without a doubt. Okay, great. So thanks for coming by. Appreciate it. Bye. Later, everybody. All right, let me be the awkward stop button guy.